Hi, everyone. Hi, and welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Olivia Marquis. I'm a part of the event staff here at Politics and Prose, where we now host in-person events and virtual events, along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-prose.com. Before we get started today, I'd like you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disturb the event. Now, while we've wa lifted the mask mandate here in the store, you're encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event, and we can provide one for you if you did not bring one. Just go up to the info desk or up near the front door. There's a thing of masks as well. Um, when we get to the time for opening the floor to your questions, we've placed a microphone right there at the end of the aisle to your right. Please line up at one of these mics so everyone can hear your question as we want that to be the question, as we want that question heard in the recording of our event. We are both audio and video recording, recording live streaming today's event so that you or anyone can find it at the Politics and Prose YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we have a signing table up here. So if you have not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind the registers at the front of the store. We ask that you line up starting here at the pillar right there and we will come by and ask your name for personalization, so please have your books ready. So once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs and lead them up against something sturdy to help us out a little bit. So now, without further ado, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Linda Kinsler celebrating the release of Come Through Court and Cry, How the Holocaust Ends, an engaging work guided by Kinsler's own family story, as well as historical archives from multiple nations that looks, like, that looks at what it takes to prove history and achieve justice in the current age. Linda Kinsler is a writer and PhD candidate at the Rhetoric Department at UC Berkeley. She was also a Marshall Scholar, where she covered British politics for the Atlantic. She's a contributing writer at Politico, was a managing editor at The Republic, where she covered the war in Ukraine, and she has written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, Columbia Journalism Review, and many others. She currently lives in Washington, D.C. Kinsler will be joined in conversation by Julia Iafi. A, par a founding partner and Washington correspondent for Puck, a new media company built around its journalists. As an internationally recognized expert on Russia, her work, sorry, her work on the subject has appeared in numerous publications, including the Washington Post, New York Times Magazine, and Politico Magazine. Please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Linda Kinsler and Julia Yaffe. Hello, everyone. So as I was saying to Linda backstage, this one really means a lot because I first met Linda back in 2013, I mm -hmm. think, when uh, Linda was just a young <laughs> reporter researcher at the New Republic where we worked with the great Leon Wieseltier. And uh, we got to work very closely together the first time Russia invaded Ukraine back in 2014. And Linda was invaluable in both writing and reporting from the region, and also editing pieces that we brought in from Ukrainian and Russian voices. And we've been friends and colleagues ever since. Um, Linda has her own remarkable story, which is uh, one of the touchstones of this book, which I have to say, sorry, I have to quell a little bit. Um, you and I have been talking about this book for a long time. Years. Yeah, years. And um, one of the things that you do is really undersell yourself. Mm -hmm. And you really undersold this book to me. <laughs> um, you told me it was go going to be very academic, i.e. boring. And that is not true. Uh, I don't know if people can see. I'm like, I have dark circles under my eyes. I have not been sleeping much the last few week, the last few days because I keep thinking, okay, I'm just going to read a couple more chapters, I'm going to read a couple more chapters, and then it's 3 a.m. because I can't put this book down. Uh, it is absolutely gripping. It is absolutely remarkable. As I wrote to Leon, it is a stunning, remarkable book that only somebody who is a generational <laughs> talent could write. Um, I think I have never read anything like this, and I mean that I in the tried. best way possible. I tried. <laughs> This is really a remarkable book. Um, so I want to, I think, start at the very beginning, which is how did you, I mean, this book has so many layers, mm -hmm. and, it, and it is so intricately 
and masterfully woven together. It has all these storylines. It takes place in London, Riga, Moscow, Montevideo. Um, I think there are parts in New York and Washington. And, and it jumps around in time. And there are all these different characters mm -hmm. and different trials that you're talking about and uh, different aspects of the Holocaust. And it's all woven together so seamlessly. And then there's your family story in there. And it's still, and, and the, the propulsion of the narrative is still so strong that I can't, I have not slept this week. <laughs> well, um, sorry about that. So I wanted to ask you how, where the germ of this book yeah. came, with the, where it started for you. Yeah, um, basically, and I've been saying this over and over again, I really didn't set out to write about my family. It's not you know, as a journalist, as a scholar, you're taught not to do that, not to bring yourself into the narrative. And I had no intention of doing so, except I discovered this uh, criminal prosecution that was going on in Riga. So basically, for those who aren't familiar with the kind of basic plot line of the book, um, it began this journey when I was in grad school in the UK at Cambridge, kind of like idly looking for a research subject, as one does. and you know, looking up my family history in Riga, Latvia, and particularly the history of my paternal grandfather who disappeared after World War II. And quickly, what is your family history? <laughs> well, my from my mother's side, they were Soviet Jews, largely from Ukraine, some of whom were killed at Babin Yar, um, which is the largest Holocaust killing site in Eastern Europe. And on my father's side, they were Latvians. And this particular story began with the mystery of my paternal grandfather who disappeared. Uh, and we knew he belonged to this killing commando called the RIS Commando in Riga, and then at some point began to work for the KGB after the war. So I was kind of looking into this and discovered a court case involving one of his um, colleagues is too gentle of a word, but involving a man he would have known named Herbert Zuckers, who was posthumously on trial 60 years after he was murdered by Mossad in South America. So that's kind of where it began. And I couldn't, you can't walk away from that. So, okay, so he worked with Zuckers, uh, and they together were working for the Nazis in Correct. Latvia, doing what? They, it was part of, you know, what is colloquially, unfortunately, referred to as the Holocaust by bullets. Uh, which was very distinct from what happened in Western Europe, um, you know, where we have this kind of much more familiar story of concentration camps in the Baltic states and much of Eastern Europe. It was a more intimate form of murder where those the perpetrators often knew the people who they were escorting to their deaths. And is one of the reasons that we got the gas chambers, right? Right, right, because it was so difficult for them, so and more efficient, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things we talked about, so you mentioned that you didn't want to bring yourself into this. And one right. of our discussions, with like a recurring topic of our discussions, is I was saying you have to bring yourself into this. Right. Like, how many people are there who are descended both from Jews and Holocaust survivors and Nazis in one person? Right. And that's the only reason why I was able to write this, why I was interested in the case in the first place, because it you know, for me, I studied the Eichmann trial, and I was so attuned to the complexities of that case, the failures of that case, and the triumphs of it. And then I discovered that Mossad sent the same agent who had kidnapped Eichmann back to South America to assassinate this Latvian man, Herbert Zuckers, and left essentially, uh, they left a speech from the Nuremberg trial, the closing speech of the chief British prosecutor, Sir Hartley Shawcross, on his body. And that's where the title of the book comes from. The last line of that speech is, imagine all of mankind comes before you and comes to this court and cries, these are our laws, let them prevail. And so that's where the title of the book comes from. And Mossad later issued a verdict saying, you know, we wanted to have a court martial of this man, but we didn't have time because he was armed. And so he tried to shoot us, and so we had to kill him before we got to read him his official sentence. That's the official version of the story, and there's a lot more to say about, you know, um, what might be the actual case. So, yeah. 
So before we get to that that part of it, um, how did it just to get really touchy? How did it feel to you know bring like grapple with this part of your family history? I mean, you write about this a bit about what it's like, you know, hunting for your grandfather who who disappeared before your father was even born, right? right? And that and his story was pretty jealously guarded by your grandmother while she yeah. was alive. Um, yeah. Tell us about the experience of looking for information of, of, of about this man who you're descended from, who worked first for the Nazis, then for the Soviets. Yeah, I mean, my grandmother, she didn't say anything. She didn't leave any diaries, she didn't leave any notes. And she said that he took almost everything with him when he disappeared. Um, How did he disappear? He said he was going on a business trip to a closed Soviet city of Silame, which at the time was the site of the Soviet Union's uranium mines. So it wasn't even on the map. It wasn't a place where you could casually go. You had to have permission to exit and enter. Um, and the official story is that he committed suicide there. Um, but obviously there was no body. Um, yeah. So how did it feel? Uh, it was exhausting. It was extremely emotionally taxing. And also, I think as there's this not unique, but it is a feature of people who are writing from the distance of the third generation, which I certainly am, which means that I'm not, you know, I have a distance from the event which allows me to approach it, you know, with some degree of measurement, but that's not to say it made it any easier. Um, and it did mean also that I became more intimately familiar with this history, right? You know, the Latvian side of my family was kind of a mystery to me before. Um, having grown up largely among Soviet Jews. And so, you know, at first I was pretty naive and blindly curious, as one has to be to kind of do this to oneself for seven years. Um, and now I think I just need, like, I've had so much exposure that I need to take a few steps back from it. There was, um, there were parts you were describing that really resonated for me as somebody who's also working on a book that's also partly about family history in this in the Soviet space um, and it's the part where you just you describe a looking at the KGB cards mm -hmm. um, these bags that were left behind at the KGB headquarters uh, what used to be the KGB headquarters in Riga and and you're like how you slide down these rabbit holes and you do it with such mastery because you go into kind of the theory of you know how we know what we know and what a historical source even means and how to handle it, how to interpret it, and how to interrogate it. Um, that was so fascinating for me. Um, and also when you talk about Biruta, right, yeah. your grandmother, yeah. how you were like, oh, she died in 2002 before I even knew how many questions I had to ask her or what yeah. questions to even ask her. Right, right, and I really sincerely wish that I had the opportunity, of course, but because she was, this was her life, you know, it wasn't a kind of casual thing. And I don't know, um, I did get to ask some questions kind of of my um, great aunt, but by the time I could ask, she was already, you know, so advanced in age that it was hard to get a clear response from her. But yeah, the story, and I don't know, I think at the beginning, as I was saying, I felt as I looked at these KGB cards, basically whenever someone was registered as an informant, they got a card, uh, and it was usually handwritten, although in the later years it was typed. And so there you can see generally their name, sometimes their code name, their date of registration, um, kind of sometimes where they were, what they were doing. But usually they don't have that much information, and a lot of them were burned. Uh, when the Soviets were leaving Latvia, but they did leave these bags there, a few of them, and it's a huge mystery what, why they left those bags, you know, and if those were planted, if you can trust them, um, if any of the cards were worthy of trust or could be actual historical documents. So as I kind of grew to understand this more, I just felt the ground coming out from underneath me. And of course to say, oh, we can't know is not a satisfying response. You know, it's not a satisfying way of looking at history so you have to glean something from it you know and it's the same thing that gets to the heart of the book which is that a lot of the court case that I started investigating has to do with Soviet interrogation records of Nazi collaborators 
And one of the arguments that the prosecutor made was that you can't trust these, you know? We can't verify how they were collected, therefore, you know? And I know there's a lot of lawyers here who will have their own opinions about that. But for me, it was quite revelatory. Right. And the, I mean, the whole book is about kind of how do you, like you said, how do you tell a story from A to Z? How do you know when you've gotten to Z, right? And also, how do you, how do you trust like when it's so of such vital importance to document a story mm -hmm. and to figure out exactly what happened and who did what to whom, but you can't, uh, you can't trust certain people, certain documents, or um, you have rules in place that don't let you admit certain right. things as evidence. How do you tell that story? Yeah, I mean, I think I found myself kind of that's why the epigraph that opens the book is about there's this amazing quote from the nation magazine which had an anonymous column called the drifter in 1928 and the there was this um, persona in journalism called the riga correspondent and the riga correspondent could have been in london could have been in paris they could have been anywhere but the only thing that was true about the riga correspondent is that whatever they were writing was not trustworthy it was kind of manufactured rewritten accounts of whatever was coming out of the Soviet press, um, rewritten for kind of more Anglo-European audiences. Um, and so they say, you know, I looked up Riga and the encyclopedia and it said that it manufactured oats. That must be an outdated version. By this time, the rumors far outnumber the oats, you know? And that, like, the proliferation of conspiracy was where I ended up going, you know, in studying actually how you come to believe conspiracy and why so many people indulge in it and how it works its way even into the people who are supposed to be finding fact, which is, you know, of course, the prosecutor. So Right. So the, the other thing that I found so interesting about the book is that you get into uh, both the Nuremberg trial or the Nuremberg trials, right, because it's a, like a cluster of them, and the Eichmann trial, mm -hmm. which are still held up as these paragons of justice, right? And these, um, at least on the surface, right? There are these um, examples of justice served, uh, justice meted out, and um, the institutions performing as they should, right? Mm -hmm. Like back in the halcyon days of like, right, right. W when we could do this right. Um, and the, the way you tell the story is it's actually the institutions kind of slipping, like making things up as they go along, slipping and sliding, and actually doing a pretty shitty job mm -hmm. because the thing they're trying to grapple with is impossible yeah. to get a, get a right, handle right. on. Right, yeah, and I mean that, again, like it was so interesting to me to think about what they excluded, you know, and there's this, one story in the book, one of the main characters is this Holocaust survivor from Riga named Edward Anders who um, went to testify at Nuremberg and only to have his testimony excluded because it came too late in the process. Uh, and then after that disappointment, he went back to his kind of temporary home in Germany and began collecting more testimonies. That was his job um, to kind of recruit whoever was in Germany at the time to say, okay, what can you remember? Or can we get it down? Can we ship it to the relevant authorities? And um, including one of the most important things he did, which is why he emerges as a central figure in the book is because he was collecting evidence against Herbert Zuckers, the same testimonies that are now being kind of uh, thrown away as untrustworthy, you know, in the present. So I don't know, I think I just kept going and and the other thing that I have to say, which for me was such a revelation, was that because in the present all of these testimonies were, you know, not being considered or not being admitted into evidence, the Jewish community in Riga were like, okay, well, we're going to go back to these world historical trials. We're going to take evidence that was admitted then and bring it to you now and say if, see if you can throw that out, you know? And so they got the one testimony from the Eichmann trial that mentioned Zuckers by name and brought it back into the proceeding, you know? And so these cases are so entwined, you can't pull them apart. Um, and that to me was a total discovery. Yeah, the, the, the subject of relitigating the past as the evidence becomes um, easier to interrogate right. and question and as the living evidence disappears, right? As the people who actually saw it, even if um, 
it wasn't always admissible, right? You talk about the parts where the judges and the prosecutors were like, well, do we want to rely on witness testimony? We just want documents, et right. cetera, right? But it's a, th this idea of people, you, you know, the subtitle is how the Holocaust ends, and you seem to imply that it ends with people with denialism seeping into the institutions, right? Where that are si that are supposed to establish fact, right. but here they're kind of watering down, washing it away. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think like subtitles are a really uh, horrible genre, and so I, uh, it's not <laughs> ideal. But you have to, you know, take everything that's in a book and distill it into one inadequate phrase, basically. Um, and so I'm very aware of that, and I write in the prologue that it's certainly not a prescription. You know, but it is a warning about precisely what you're describing, you know, about the possibility that because people are so hungry for endings, which can never arrive, and which we, in fact, in many ways do not want to arrive for this particular episode of history, this desire for a verdict does lead you to have, you know, the easiest possible one by people who, you know, prosecutors leave our, in Poland, in Latvia, in Lithuania, who are reaching for the easiest way to get this off their docket. You know, which means you can't, this is all impugned. Why is it on their docket to begin with? Why do these countries want so badly to rewrite this history? Yeah, I mean. These, I'm sorry, these darlings of like neocons who are like, oh, these, these uh, s democratic success stories. Right, this event is being recorded. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's in, on the one hand, it's an obvious search for national heroes. You know, it's like, it's, when you have like a story of nationhood that has been so consistently interrupted um, and actively destroyed, you know, by several occupying powers, of course you l reach for whatever you can. I think it's a different, like what we're seeing here is a consistent attempt to undermine historical judgment, um, which is a more subtle form of denialism, revisionism, whatever you want to call it, than simply saying, you know, we want a national hero. And that, to me, is what makes it most threatening because it's saying, no, we're not done with legal judgment. No, we're, like, going to take whatever you, whatever well-established truths you want about the past and we're going to relitigate it. And nothing is off limits because of the nature of these crimes, right, because of the statute of limitations. Um, and if you kind of keep going down that route, there's no place to end. It's not totally unlike what we're seeing in this country. We'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> but first, I want to push you on this. But why this? Like, why are they rewriting or trying to rewrite the history of the Holocaust yeah. in their own countries and their own government's roles in this, even if it was a different government, right. even if it was generations ago? Right. Why? Well, I mean, I think it's they don't want a history of collaborationism, you know, a usable path. They want, and as we've discussed, part of this is about the process of reckoning and memorializing, which has become a kind of de facto way of signaling membership in the European community, right? There was a kind, you know, there's a reason why all the memorials go up in 2004, 2005. Um, and when those went up, you didn't have a corresponding public understanding of what collaboration actually was in those places. And unfortunately, that is only now becoming kind of more popular knowledge. In Ukraine, it was just starting um, right before they bombed Babin Yar. Um, so I think that's what it is, you know, in the ca and that's what you see in all of the cases. They don't want records of collaborationism. They want at least to cast a shadow of a doubt over it. I was what okay. Do you think? <laughs> I think it's a little anti-Semitism, but okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I thought the way very early on in the book that you set up the the kind of the binary between memory and justice mm -hmm. was very interesting, and that you throughout the book you pair memory with basically law and like and what the law is and legal theory, and you take this thing that. I think many people think of as like a hard concept mm -hmm. and like a very as something that you can lean on, something that's quite firm, and you show how flimsy it is and how flimsy institutions are, which mm -hmm. I think we are seeing in this country, right? Right. Yeah. No, and I thought was really deliberate because I think uh, the where that opposition comes from is the end of Yosef Yerushalmi's amazing book Zahor on 
Jewish history and memory where in the postscript he says, oh no, I was invited to a conference on forgetting um, <laughs> and kind of apologizes to his audience in advance and says at the very end, you know, I came across this clipping in Le Monde and the, it was a questionnaire for the French audience and it said, um, which of these words do you think of when you think about the trial of Klaus Barbie, which was of course one of the famous um, trials of Holocaust perpetrators. And the question was, do you think about forgetting or justice? And instead of forgetting or remembering. And um, he thought, you know, maybe the journalists got it right when they put those two words against each other. And so that was the question that I, you know, was trying to answer in my book because it, it kept coming back to memory. You know, you could say it's about law, but really it's about memory. And even this litigation is ultimately about what memories are we going to uphold? How are we going to, you know, um, what kind of collective understanding do we want? And it was a really fascinating moment when I got to sit in on a meeting of um, like one of the U.S. envoys in Riga talking with high school educators in Latvia about kind of what stories do we have and their their overwhelming conclusion was we don't have stories you know we don't have this narrative that we need so yeah in the having written having done the work to write this book having written it edited whatever um not whatever uh how do you how do you look at institutions now you know like i the the discourse in this in this country specifically you know the institutions will will save us the institutions yeah. will hold or they have held yeah how do you look at that discourse now having written this book oh god um <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know i want to be hopeful i don't i hopeful but not blind um i think that what's incredibly different is that and what I really understood was that in, in the part of the world where I was looking at, those are young institutions comparatively, honestly, you know, and there's this total vacuum where they have inherited so many previous legal systems, which they have not, you know, expurgated or dealt with in any real way, such that, you know, and the the category of rehabilitation, which I write about, and you know, you could in the Soviet Union you could rehabilitate someone um, if it was found that the crime for which they were suppressed never actually happened, or for various political reasons. But um, the most common reason for rehabilitating someone was that the corpus delicti, the body of the crime, was never found. You know. Um, and that is the reason why this case happened in the first place in 1996. And so just the, that hangover, you know, and I know um, people use the word hangover to talk about the post-Soviet period a lot, but in this case it really is apt. Um, and it, they kind of just got all clumped together all in one. So I think that is ex obviously distinct from here, I would like to think. Um, the other thing that really struck me, again, reading this here in the U.S. in the current context mm -hmm. was the way in which everybody wanted to have a trial. Everybody wants to have a trial, right? right? Eichmann goes to Jerusalem because the Israelis want to have a trial yeah. now that the Europeans had their trial. And at the, and at the European trial at Nuremberg, they're fighting over how they're going to do the trial. Are they going to do it the continental way or the Anglo-Saxon way, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that there, that there's something that um, that there's like a theater, the theater of the trial that confers some kind of legitimacy, mm -hmm. some kind of political legitimacy, to yeah. whatever political project the authorities currently in power are trying to do. Right. Right. I mean, I think I've been thinking a lot about this particular moment where we have, on the one hand, the January six proceedings going on. Um, and we also have, on the other side of the world, we have uh, these prosecutions by, you know, Ukrainians and these calls for a new Nuremberg. You know, there is, like, almost immediately, of course, and for very good reasons, and let's hope that it happens in some form. Um, but it is an interesting moment to think about what that, you know, desire for an ending, hunger for this kind of public proceeding, as if that will expurgate us from all of these horrors, um, how that is operating. For sure. And I also think, you know, 
I have always been fascinated by the um, MH17 trial, which we covered back in 2014 when it first occurred, um, when uh, the separatists in Ukraine hit um, the Malaysian Airlines plane. Uh, that proceeding has been ongoing in the Netherlands for years now, and the verdict is about to be delivered in November um, in absentia. And it's just, to me, one of these totally fascinating cases that no one really talks about anymore, but really is the first um, public, publicized trial of this conflict. So we'll see. What, do you, what are your thoughts about it? What do you think it means? What do you think uh, is the fallout going to be from it? Yeah. What is the significance of it if nobody's paying attention and nobody's going to yeah. see the inside of a courtroom? Yeah, well, it's interesting. The Dutch clearly thought it was going to be a huge thing. Th if you look at it, it's an incredibly beautiful media production because they realized, you know, all of these prosecutions are happening in absentia. Um, the verdicts that will happen will, you know, obviously be questioned um, and are being questioned from the very start by the uh, lawyers representing the four separatists who are on trial. Three of them are Russian, one of them is Ukrainian. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's an amazing example and it's happening in The Hague, which makes people think about it as if it's this kind of grand proceeding, but it's a district court. Um, it's a tiny, tiny proceeding with very, very large ambitions. Um, and of course, when they started, they didn't know that this, you know, second wave of the invasion was going to start. So I don't know. I think it's just extremely illustrative. And there's often events like these, trials like these, that set the tone for what unfortunately will come. I want to say great, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is, this is a phenomenal book. And I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Um, so I think we should go to Q&A because these familiar faces are quite interesting people. <laughs> so the microphone's over here. Please ask a question. Please, unlike me, keep it concise and ask a question. And if you don't ask a question, I will be very mean to you. Hi again, uh, it's Milana. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, I'm sorry for my English. I wanted to ask you, uh, I know that these kind of um, stories, there are, it's a particular genre between like your personal point of view and uh, stay in distance. But this story actually, it's, um, it's something special and I wanted to ask how, how difficult it was to be not biased, you know? Did you feel this feeling, did you have this feeling uh, when you were writing, when you were doing a research that you are writing about your family, especially about this man? Did you mm -hmm. feel like he is part of my family or you were writing about him like like some, some person? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, no, it's a great question. I think... Uh, one of the kind of great joys and uh, terrors of journalism is that you can take any subject, no matter how emotionally or personally difficult it might be, and try to turn it into a subject, you know, which I know that I do um, to my detriment. And so I tried not to do that with this particular subject. Um, I think I, you know, as Julia said, I was worried a lot about how to. I really would prefer not to write about myself. Unfortunately, in this case, it wasn't an option. Um, and that was part of the kind of objective narration of the book. But what did happen, I like kept up this facade as of like, oh, I'm just a kind of, you know, journalist, observer, you know, kind of like naive descendant until I was asked by the Latvian Jewish community you know, I developed relationships with them. I was, you know, working with them and sharing notes for many, many years. I was asked by them if I would uh, help them recruit a witness for the case um, because it was, you know, one of these survivors who I was already in conversation with. And I said, of course, you know, of course I'll relay the request. Um, and that was the moment when I became someone who was acting in the case rather than, you know, just a total bystander if I could ever claim to have occupied that in the beginning. You know, I can't really claim that. Um, 
So I don't know. I think the reason why the book is so hard to describe generically is because that's precisely the what the tension that I refuse to resolve really for myself. So I don't know. I hope it comes across in the book, really. But thank you. We'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a fascinating book. Thank you. Uh, and I will read it. Um, and it's hard to ask a question about it without reading it. Um, I do think Ukraine has, has an odd feeling for Jews because all the names are familiar. Mm -hmm. we, did, we didn't even know it was Ukraine, but Lviv, which is now Lviv, and, Ki and Kiev, which mm -hmm. is now Kiev. Uh, those are all, and what we were brought up to call Baba Yar because I think that's probably the Russian pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the attack on the bomb that hit Babi Yar was just an accident, or do you think they did it intentionally? That's a good question. It's a good question, because Linda actually wrote an amazing piece about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think they were explicitly targeting the TV tower, which was, you know, it's right. a trick question, because the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they were deliberately targeting it. Why they were deliberately targeting it is because the Soviets built um, what at one point was supposed to be the like largest um, TV tower in the Soviet Union on the site, um, and it's within you know there's a lot of people say oh the actual territory of Babinyar, the where the mass graves themselves were located wasn't um, bombed, which is correct. None of the memorials themselves were destroyed. However, there the area is now this huge um, national reserve, which is where the TV tower is, as well as kind of buildings that, you know, one of them was a gym, that were supposed to become museums to various aspects of what had occurred. One of them was going to be a museum to the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, ironically. Um, and that was what was completely destroyed by the bombing. So but maybe that's why the TV tower was where it was. Right, no, of course, and that's the thing is that the Soviets tried to totally obliterate the land, right, and this kind of, along with it, the story of what happened there. Um, so I think, I mean, the beginning of your question is, you know, really interesting now, and I think that's why at the beginning of this um, phase of the war, a lot of American Jews didn't know really how to think necessarily about Ukraine or, like, wanted some kind of guidance about it. And I think that's, you know, totally fair, but it is also true that it's a totally different country now. Um, and I was say, as I was saying earlier, a lot, you know, in the last 30 years, so much has happened to kind of create these narratives of what actually happened in the realities, right? Like not sugarcoating it, you know? And um, right. that's the version of it that I choose to, you know, believe is that there are the generation that's in power now in Ukraine, you know, like young 30 year olds who are trying to rebuild their cities as fast as they can. You know, they want the actual story of collaboration um, and victimhood and everything that goes along with it, you know? So, and that's the future of Ukraine, you know? It's not these kinds of horrible stories, which are also true, you know? Um, but yeah, that's how I'm thinking about it. Sounds like the French resistance. <laughs> hey. um, it's such a good book, and, and I recommend everyone to read it. And it's interesting because of all the themes you talked about. And You're biased because you blurbed it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what comes first, the blurbing or the bias. But um, I'm very intrigued by something you said today about the opposite of forgetting being justice. Um, and obviously your book is part of this, but also Ukraine is a very important part of this, and also what's going on around January the 6th in America. I mean, usually justice we associate with lawyers, mm -hmm. and they have a clearer role to play on it. I just wonder for you as a writer, where do you stand with, in relationship to justice? I mean, there's simple stuff like, you know, the New Yorker doing an expose of Harvey Weinstein, and then there's a trial. That's easy. But, but what is... You know, I, I write books as well, and Julia obviously does, and, and Leon does. What's our role in justice? I don't see my role as doing justice usually. Quite the opposite. I'm usually questioning, undermining, right. you know. How well, are we going to... You just juxtaposed it with writing rather than memory. No, what's our role? Yeah. What's the role of the writer 
in this project of justice beyond just sort of just you know excavating a crime like like you know investigative journalism right. does what's our what should we be working with lawyers at the moment is that what we should be doing i mean well i know that's what you're doing well but <laughs> i think it's very complicated doing that i think it, it's full of it's full of complications you know? right uh what do we do in this search for justice yeah i mean i'm gonna i think m my answer is we kind of help people arrive at narratives that they can use or forget however they choose to uh with the knowledge that whatever tribunals do come out of our you know efforts are going to be inadequate you know that's kind of where i am right now and it's not a very happy place to be uh but that's yeah i don't know i kind of think it's like you give people a story and then you let them take it or leave it you know because a trial is also the same thing uh you take it or you leave it uh, and people will always be unsatisfied with whatever comes out of it so maybe you can give me a more hopeful answer i think you know it's a question i mean like i think i think there's no one else in the queue so i'm just gonna chat uh, <laughs> um it's like it's like it's like um no i think you said something just about satisfaction whenever i've talked to people who've looked for justice syria you know uh anything to do with the hague they always feel unsatisfied at the end so i wonder whether our job is actually to look for a much deeper satisfaction because I don't think we can replicate what lawyers do, and I think we should. Well, but but I think mm. what was sorry, I think what was so interesting about Linda's book is she gets at at, at this feeling of dissatisfaction mm. that there is nothing that can satisfy this ever. N that a writer can't it, like she, you talk about who, uh, the the guy who testified at the Eichmann trial, mm -hmm. right? Who said that I can't describe what I saw at, at Auschwitz. I've been trying to find the words yeah. to describe what I saw at Auschwitz the and. Yeah, the novelist, and he says, "I can't." Yeah, yeah. and and uh, and the lawyers who are trying to figure out how to bend existing systems of law and justice around something that has never happened before or since to bring justice, but it's 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 not possible, right? Because it's mm -hmm. it's too big. It's not um, right. It's I mean, I can only think of a Russian, you know, abyatnya abyatnya, right? Um, yeah. And I think that that is one of the really wonderful things about your book is that exposes this um, this thing at the root of all of it, at the root of writing, at the root of justice, at the root of memory, is that some things are just you can't explain them, you can't you can't um, you can't describe them, you can't ever get justice right. for them. They're right. just too big. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's like to really answer your question, I think it's kind of refusal, Peter. Like I think the story of Katsetnik of this saying, you know, what he said to the judges at the Eichmann trial was like, no, I don't, I cannot do this, I will not do this. Because all he could produce was this testimony in the form of a novel. Um, and then he kind of famously collapsed when they forced him to testify. Mm. Uh, and one of the people who I encounter in the story was asked, who I was asked to bring into the proceeding as a witness, refused and he said no you know even though i am you know i could provide some testimony here i do not want to be a part of this proceeding because i do not see the point um not of all proceedings but in like this particular posthumous you know wow. endeavor he i mean he was like the press there's nothing nothing will come of this you know um and whatever this kind of dissatisfaction exactly like this nothing will come of this and if something does come of it it will be so you know empty uh, and he didn't want to spend the last years of his life engaged in it I mean, i'd love to get a psychiatrist involved in this conversation but but we're in dc and dc doesn't do therapy so <laughs> in new york we'd have this great i don't know um <laughs> are there any psychiatrists here do you want to talk about satisfaction i think there's someone behind you. i yeah. have a very similar question which is <laughs> so i'll just keep us here um and along with that comment that he mentioned, you, you made that comment that like this story doesn't have, this is a story that doesn't end. Right. Um, and so as a writer, as a journalist, uh, how do we keep people engaged with a story that doesn't end um, as we're searching for not just international consensus, but national, national consensus and community consensus if the story doesn't end? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think... And in this case, you know, I have to say literally it doesn't end because the case in which I, mm -hmm. that I focus on is still kind of open um, under appeal. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the best, <laughs> of course, I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, the only thing you can say is, you know, you look for touch points like this. Like this was a very, very small 
niche case yeah. you know everyone was like what is this and why would you write about it and for me in my mind it was a huge you know it had all these connotations um and that's why i what i tried to bring out in the book um and i think for me that's the, also the most compelling kind of writing is like if you have a really small thing and no one knows about it because people have forgotten about it or they're no longer paying attention or it's from a previous generation then that's like such rich ground for anyone who is in the business of telling stories or reporting in any way you know um and i you know i think that's happening a lot these days so there's some grounds for hope i mean you also mentioned that you talk to educators and i think educators obviously have mm -hmm. a huge stake in this construction of a flawed consensus um but do you see the role of a journalist similar to that of an educator or are those roles distinct in this arena <laughs> yeah I don't know I mean I guess so I you know and I think sometimes I have to think a lot about the difference between academic writing and journalistic yeah. writing and unfortunately for me I really don't know quite how to separate them and I wouldn't really say that I write in different modes um, but I mean in both cases you're trying you have the same aim right if you're trying to give people the truth or some uh, you're supposed to give people the truth and also a narrative, you know, and they want both of those things at once. And unfortunately, narratives are often like, you know, they're not neat. And to make them memorable, you have to sacrifice some complexity, you know. Um, and so even in this book, like I chose not to tell the whole story about the assassination and every single place they went over the last over the six months when he was being courted by this um, Mossad agent, you know, because that story has been told and that's a certain kind of genre that I'm not really interested in replicating, although I, you know, tried to a little bit. Well, and then there's there's also the story about the story, right, when the story is of political import, which is, again, sorry to keep bringing, back, bringing it back to the American context, but it's just such a fevered one right now. Mm -hmm. But when you're having these arguments about what the national narrative is here, where we do have ostensibly more established institutions, mm -hmm. um, where you have people banning books and academic concepts and arguing about what our national story is even here, um, there is a similar thing, right? Like where even a more established country right. is still arguing over and over and over again yeah. about story. about story yeah. and memory and justice. Yep, yep, forever. <laughs> Thank, oh you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, if there's no other takers, um, Linda will be here signing books. Definitely get one. I'm gonna buy one more. It is so, so good. Um, it is really a gripping read and haunting and beautiful and just masterfully done. Thank Congratulations, Linda, it's so good. <laughs>